Do you think this country is ready to open schools right now? Well, Ralph, we're starting with a simple question. So I yes. think the answer is, I think the answer is we have to get kids back to school and we have to figure out how to do it as safely as possible. So nothing is 100% safe. But I would also say if you look at our data, our cases are coming down most in most of the country. We're doing relatively well. There's probably not a better time to go back to school. So we've got to check it out, see if it can work. If there's a second wave coming, then we have to adjust. So I think we have to figure out how to get kids into school as safely as possible and then have a plan B. What happens if cases take off again? At what point do we shut it down again? So I think we have to be ready for both. But kids need school for a whole bunch of reasons. Parents need uh, kids in school for economic reasons. Kids need to interact. It's good for their mental health. But it's all about getting the balance right. Right. And what is that balance? When you think about what is going to make a safe classroom, what are the things that you think need to happen? I think there's a few basic things. I think that the number of children is really, really important. We haven't paid enough attention to that to allow physical distancing. Physical distancing is our number one tool. If you keep, you're not near anyone, you're never going to get infected. So that's pretty easy. Uh, and then we have to have the basic hygiene measures that we've all had pounded into our head for the last six months. Wash your hand, wear a mask, uh, you know, use your hand sanitizer, stuff like that. And then thirdly, a little more complicated is having cohorts or pods to make sure that you, again, limit your number of interactions. So every interaction is a risk with a small r, and the fewer you have, the easier it is. And the other imp really important thing about pods and class sizes is if there's a case, and there will be cases, we don't have to panic about that, is it's going to be easier to track them down and trace them and limit the spread. That's really what we want to do. We've said since day one, and people seem to have forgotten this, it's not about having no cases. That's impossible. It's about limiting the number of cases, about limiting the harm. And that's what we want to do while having the benefits of education. Uh, my eight-year-old will wear his mask for about 45 minutes before he starts complaining that, you know, it makes him feel bad and his head hurts and he, it's hard to breathe. Some readers have asked, are there going to be health consequences of children wearing masks? Like, will it affect their breathing? Um, will they feel dizzy? What do we know about that? Yeah, I think the short answer to that is no. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to be unable to breathe. You're not going to get carbon monoxide poisoning. I've seen lots of nonsense online. You'll be fine. There, there are people who do 12-hour surgeries wearing masks and they don't drop dead. So it's fine. Now, kids, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be a bother. They're going to yank at them. All that is fine. You want... Uh, you don't want uh, perfect to be the enemy of good. So you encourage them to do it. Uh, you know, our colleague Wensi Leung has written many really good service pieces about masks with some good tips. Uh, make the kids pick them themselves. Have something they like. Uh, make sure it's comfortable. Have an elastic that doesn't yank at their ears. You want to make it as easy as possible for the kids to wear them so they become second nature. And I think cloth masks are the easiest. Uh, put a couple in their lunchbox. You know, make sure they have backups so when they spit in them or get snot in them or whatever, as kids will do, that they have a, a backup. There have been some kind of um, criteria that have been put out uh, about in the U.S. about here's here's the bar at which it's safe to open schools. We haven't seen those uh, same rules come out in Canada, but can you just talk a little bit about uh, some of those guidelines that have come out and how it would apply if we did apply it in Canada? Yeah, so I think there's really good guidance out of the U.S. I was reading the, a whole bunch of provincial back-to-school plans today, and they're so obtuse and useless. There's no practical information in there. What the Americans do really well is synthesize information and give you, you know, here's how to choose and bullet form. And that's, that's what we need. So the one I really like is uh, from Harvard. The Harvard School of Public Health has this guidance where they have like a, a red light, green light system. So they say red light, if there's more, more than 25 cases per 100,000 population, then that's red light. Absolutely don't go back to school. Then they have the yellow light. If there's 5 to 10 per 100,000, uh, maybe go back, uh, be cautious. And, and then below one, green light. You should be, uh, be fine going to school. Probably not even take a, some of these measures we talked about because it means virtually no community spread. So that being said, this I like this uh, light system. Where's Canada? Most of Canada is yellow. 
So we're not doing too bad. We're like the five to 10, couple of jurisdictions. Uh, I'm seeing a creep up around 15, 20 per 100,000. But we don't, again, have large numbers like the U.S. has currently, where they have 25, 50 cases per 100,000. Mm -hmm. uh, schools shouldn't open under those circumstances. So that becomes, you know, the yellow light, proceed with caution. Or if you're in Quebec, speed up. But, you know, a yellow light is supposed to be be cautious, be ready to stop, et cetera. And I, I think that's the attitude we have to have. But overall, most countries are doing this well. So I'll take the two extremes uh, to, to pop to mind. I think one that's done it really well, one of the first countries to go back was Denmark. Now, Denmark does everything well, so they're easy to pick out. But, you know, they did everything right. They have small classes. Uh, they actually did testing of children. Uh, et cetera, low community spread. There's very few cases in their schools and their daycares. Now, the other thing we have to remember about Denmark, though, is they don't have classes of 30 to begin with. They had mm -hmm. classes of 15. That was the normal. I, again, as I said before, I think we could learn from that. Uh, the other thing is they ride their bikes to school. They don't take buses. Mm -hmm. You know, Canadians take their buses. So they have these advantages, but I think they showed us it can be done uh, the other extreme, the one that's really been singled out, is there was this huge cluster in a, a middle school in Israel. Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from that? Well, I think we can learn from that is, is that when you're arrogant, you're going to pay the price. So they didn't have masks. They took the, they were very loosey-goosey about the distancing. Uh, we don't know what was going on in the community, but I don't think they were taking it too seriously in the community. There was a fairly high number. So they did everything wrong. So that's, I think, there are important lessons at both ends of the spectrum, and hopefully we'll lean towards the learning from Denmark more than the others. Uh, then we have countries where it's a little more complicated, you know, like South Korea, they never closed their schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently they have, because they had big outbreaks again, and it started getting into school. So it, the reminder from South Korea is you have to keep up at it, no matter how difficult and pain in the butt it is, you have to keep up with these measures. When you slack off, then it, the virus is always looking for an opportunity to sneak in there. I think uh, the final thing is what I've repeated several times, is try and keep this in context. We're doing pretty well in Canada. The, we're controlling the, the disease in the community, and that's really important. Uh, it's important for kids to get an education, for their development, for their social interaction. So it's probably there's probably not a better time to do this. So that's how I would go into this. And then finally, you have to ultimately trust your gut. What do I feel uh, when I think about this? Do I want my kid there or not? And that's that what you have to do.